Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, dear teachers. It's three o'clock and we'll start now. Um, I'd like to first welcome you all to um, this webinar. Um, I hope you're all keeping well and safe and staying at home um, during this lockdown. Um, but it's a perfect opportunity to bring you this series of webinars um, conducted by Dale Edwards, who is the head of the India academic team for calm skills and drama and language. And uh, we're very happy to have Dale present this set of webinars for us. And today would be grade, initial to grade three for calm skills. Dale, um, welcome and uh, over to you. All right, thanks Renu. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, teachers. Pleasure to be with you all. Um, I know these are difficult times and circumstances and uh, um, all I can say is stay safe and this too shall pass. Um, this afternoon, of course, I know it's a Saturday afternoon and um, some of you may have perhaps taken a break from teaching earlier in the day. And for some of us, this is that time when gravity gets the better of our eyelids and we struggle. So I'm gonna try and keep this as light and entertaining as possible. And of course, informative as well. Um, so um, let's begin. Well, I understand that um, the teachers in Sri Lanka are very, very experienced and have been doing Trinity exams for about as long as we've been doing them in India. So I thought it's best to just kind of put things in a little bit of perspective um, in terms of where does this all fit in? Um, as you know, um, Trinity has been around since 1877 and we operate in 68 countries around the world. And over these last 143 odd years, when we look at what students need around the world to stay relevant uh, and to progress academically and socially and culturally, and even professionally, we shortlist these four uh, cornerstones or pillars against which students would need to have in their kitty of skills. Now I use the very interesting word of skills and I will be talking a little bit about that today. Um, but as you can see, these are the four pillars, confidence, language, transferable skills and study strategies. And just to let you know how this all fits in within the context of Trinity, um, as many of you already are engaging this pathway, you will realize that we work with children to develop their confidence from the very early ages of three onwards, um, primarily through drama, peer learning, and whatever social development theories um, we can use in that context. And as children get a little older, we work on their conversational and their oral skills, particularly with the English language. Um, and that in itself is um, a, quite an achievement for various parts of the world where we have uh, speakers of other languages and where English is the second language, that their ability and our ability to help them grow in the knowledge and use of the English language for everyday life itself means a lot. Um, so ab above that, from the age of seven, we of course know that children kind of come into their own um, and have their various favorite songs, start to develop various creative interests and so on. And that is typically the time when we work with communication, delivery, presentation and performance, um, because these are again skill sets uh, which are very well developed through the various performing arts. Um, and then, of course, when children head off um, or are about to head off into high school and undergrad and uh, postgraduate programs, there becomes that need to hone all the skills together, particularly, once again, the language skills, but this time from a reading and writing perspective as well. So this is typically how Trinity's uh, uh, various suite of assessments um, lay one over and very often into the other. Um, if I was to put subjects against these, uh, these are the subjects that you would know. The YPC or the Young Performer Certificates is for confidence building. The JESSE exams or the graded exams in spoken English is available at 12 different grades. 
Um, thereafter, we have communication skills, speech and drama, acting, performance arts, and musical theater. And finally, of course, at the higher levels for language, we have um, one of the leading, in fact, the leading English exam in the world, but it's more than just an exam. It's a way that you could teach English. Uh, and that is through the integrated skills in English. Um, now you would see in the left-hand margin that I've mentioned CEFR and RQF and so on. Um, and that is only for the simple reason that Trinity, in addition to being an examination board and having benchmarked uh, a lot of the learning outcomes and assessment criteria, also has their qualifications conforming to or regulated by larger bodies. So our English exams are mapped to the CEFR or the Common European Framework of Reference for Language. And that kind of covers all European languages, whether it's French, German, Spanish, uh, et cetera. Um, and of course, in the case of our communication skills in speech and drama and all of those exams, it's benchmarked to the regulated qualification framework in the UK and the EQF in the rest of Europe. And that of course uh, has oversight under something known as OFQUAL, which is the Office of Qualifications, which is a governmental department in the UK. So with that as a backdrop, just because I understand from today is um, going through the list of teachers, there are very many of us over here who are coming with different backgrounds. And some of us are perhaps language teachers, some of us are involved in the performance arts, some of us are looking at communication skills for the first time, and some of us are teachers who could be subject teachers or social studies or math or science. And I'm glad if you are, and I'm very happy to have you join us because the subject of communication <clears throat> is not restricted to the English language and certainly not restricted only to the English teacher. Uh, in fact, all of us as teachers, no matter what your subject, if you're teaching it in English, then you are already being communicative to a very large extent. So I'd like for this afternoon to be a, an exploration or a discovery into a few key elements that I've kind of listed out for you today. One is to consider the need and importance of communication skills in this world in which we live in. And then of course, to deep dive and look at what does the syllabus really offer? Um, and of course, we will look at examinations and look at the grades, particularly initial to three and the various tasks. And then of course, I'd be happy to kind of um, come full circle and answer any questions that may arise it, with regard to anything we are discussing today. So we've got lots to do and let's start. Now, the subject of communication is exceedingly common by definition or by name at least, but when one tries to capture the essence of it, I have to tell you academically, we struggle for the simple reason that it's not an old subject, although it's been used since man roamed the earth, um, but as a subject and as an area of study, believe it or not, as of 1976, the definition has evolved more than 126 times. So I think you can understand that it is an exceedingly dynamic subject made more dynamic by every passing generation, uh, evolution of language, evolution of technology and so on. But before we get into that, let's just understand why the need for communication skills. What is the importance of it today? Now, I'm using the example of India and I think this kind of applies to almost all education right now around the world, uh, in so much as um, our students do very well. Percentages in India, certainly we're used to seeing 95 is perhaps the new 70. Um, and students get 99% almost very often. And on one hand, as educationists, as schools, we can perhaps pat ourselves on the back but the big challenge that remains is what happens when these young learners step into the workplace. And from various accounts, we see that many of them are not able to make that leap or very often are found out of step 
with what is the requirement in the real world or the workplace. So as you can see in this image, the bulb is not lit up. So the question is what will light that bulb up? The simple answer to that is communication skills and some 21st century skills. Now, um, if one looks at the importance of these skills, there are various places one can look at for reports or intelligent reading, but I think perhaps the one that many all of us can uh, relate to would be the LinkedIn reports. Um, and over here, you can see that as of 2019, and I'll be sharing with you a couple of them, all right, uh, I've circled India over there, which I'm in many ways would mirror what Sri Lanka uh, is experiencing. Um, the need and the importance of soft skills, in this case, they use a slightly larger connotation, is as high as 95%, which means that almost everybody acknowledges and accepts, and certainly in the professional sphere, that there is a genuine need to develop these skills. Now, if you look to the extreme right of this uh, image, you'd start to see some of the European countries and you'd wonder why their percentages were so much lower than ours. And the truth is that a lot of the Western world has always focused on these skills as part of their education systems. So it's inbuilt in what they do through their learning processes and certainly in the way in which they assess students, that that is why it's the countries which are experiencing new development, new growth, new educational systems that really are feeling the need for these skills. In fact, various reports, even as far as the workplace report of 2018, on your right hand side, you would see that as much as 92% of good hiring decisions revolved around good communication skills. And where the hiring went bad, as much as 89% of the fault could be found with poor communication skills. So I think it's fair to say that communication skills is not only an important skill set to have, but it becomes an even more important skill set to have when you're looking at the senior management positions or running an organization or building your own organization to the level of uh, you being in charge. And there again, we see that skills like leadership, communication, collaboration um, are all tied in kind of hand in hand. So the question that remains then is how can we develop communication skills, particularly in India and our part of the world where education systems or traditional education systems because of sheer number, because of the nature of or the, the, the structure that we aren't able to individually develop this in classroom settings. Uh, hence, perhaps we use the more tried and tested um, standardized testing methodologies and uh, a model in which the teaching talk time to the student talk time is almost 90 to 10. And in a case like that, we need to perhaps look at doing this on our own and for our own kids and for ourselves. Now, I think it's suffice to say that the world has experienced communication skills I'm sharing with you a couple of quotes from around the world, um, all the business leaders alike. Um, and please forgive me if this screen may be a little too small for you to see it all. Uh, I'm just trying to do my best to share my, to keep this as large as possible. There you go. M marginally better, I guess. Um, but anyway, perhaps you'll see these two very well. And if you're in the mood for some Saturday weekend humor, I think it's suffice to say that communication is key to life. For if you can't communicate, it's like winking at a girl in the dark. Now, I think I've laid the foundation for why communication skills is so important. And most importantly, not only is communication today a right protected by various legal protections that the, our countries offer us, but 
is key. Um, and I will share this in perhaps the following webinar. Uh, some of the studies that have that been done around the subject to suggest just why it is so important. But that now brings me to the task at hand, which is to consider the syllabus and look very closely at what the syllabus has to offer us. So if you are looking at the physical syllabus for when we had face-to-face -face examinations, you should be looking at the purplish mauve kind of syllabus cover. And if you're looking at the digital version, then you should be looking at a green one. Now, an important point of distinction over here, um, the communication skills assessments are conducted in the English language, but we are not assessing the English language. In fact, we would go one further to say that we assume that the English is already secure. In fact, the minimum guidance that we've mentioned is a B1 level on the CEFR. And for all candidates attempting um, grade, the higher grades of our communication skill syllabus, they should be having between B2 and C1. Um, these, of course, are the common European framework markers of can-do statements that describe what learning ability of language is at that respective level. Now, let's look quickly at what the syllabus has to offer us. So this um, is kind of the snapshot of what, is, what lies in the syllabus. And I want to point out, if you are new to a Trinity syllabus, that we're very different from other typical syllabi, in so much as normally a syllabus would kind of uh, mention what are the topics, the chapters, and of course you'd rush off to go through page to page uh, until you can cover the content in the syllabus. Well, the Trinity syllabus differs in that way. It's made up of several things, starting with why is the subject relevant? What kind of guidance is there for ages? Um, most importantly, what are the learning outcomes, the assessment criteria, the attainment bands, um, the 21st century skills derived from the syllabus, and of course, finally, how are these exams recognized in different parts of the world. So if one was to look at why the syllabus is so important, as you can see, quite simply, it helps us to firstly focus on practical, creative tasks that reflect real world situations. And I want to point that out because very often the education that we perhaps sometimes receive is great from a knowledge point of view, but how relevant is it? Or how can we take it, learn from it and apply it in the now modern context? So this syllabus is all about making it relevant. And in addition to that, it very importantly develops invaluable 21st century skills, all right, in communication, creativity, that along the way help build confidence in both education and the workplace by letting you progress. Now, these are some of the 21st century skills or transferable skills that we are referring to. Now, I wanna stop a moment and say, in case you're wondering what transferable skills are, uh, let me give you an example. So supposing um, there is a football match going on and a group of boys from two opposing teams get into a little bit of a fisticuff or an argument. And um, one of them decides to go and broker some peace. And he goes and points out to them the irony of the situation that they've all come here to have fun and yet they're fighting and they're wasting time. So why not we just go on with the game and uh, forgive and forget, or resolve it a little later, or better still shake hands and move on. Now, in that instant, this particular boy who has helped resolve this problem between a group of them has developed in him or has used a skill like conflict resolution. That same boy, if he was to go, let's say, perhaps home, where there may be conflict at home, or 10 years later is in a workplace environment, and there was, let's say, some element of discord, he would then use 
his skill to help try and resolve the conflict. So that is what a transferable skill is. Now, a skill in its very definition is basically the ability to do and to do something well. And it's important to point it out because we keep hearing the word skills. And we very often say, well, schools help develop skills. So I wanna put that in context. If for instance, and I'll use the analogy of a, of a bicycle and say, there are two parts to it. One is to know what goes into making a bicycle and the other is to go what goes into riding a bicycle. And if you know one, you certainly don't know the other, but you wish you did. So hence, not only must you know the parts of the bike, but then you also have to finally get on that cycle and ride it. So it means that the skill will be developed by actually doing. So hence, in this syllabus, all the skills that you will develop come from actually doing. And because they are transferable skills can be used in a plethora of scenarios uh, as you go along in life. Now, if we were to consider what is what are the levels, what are the grades? If you're familiar with our speech and drama syllabus, then this is happy reading for you. Essentially, we're split down into four different levels. The RQF level refers to the regulated qualification framework level to which all our uh, learning outcomes are benchmarked. Uh, and within this, we have level one, level two, level three, which offers these grades, initial one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Now, these grades are very unlike typical school grades because it's mapped to the qualification framework. A level three or grades six to eight are genuinely or most of the time suitable for learners who are 16 and over. So it's typically at a high school level that you would do grades six to eight or level three. And the right age to perhaps be starting this um, skill set is five and over. Now, if you recall the first um, overlay that I showed you, very often a lot of teachers uh, implement both. So after a child's English language is rooted, they thereafter start to offer speech and drama. And in one round and in the following round or following year, complement it with communication skills. Now you're wondering why? Well, let me put it to you this way. Imagine it as two sides of a coin where communication skills will help develop you to have something to say. And the other side of the coin, which is speech and drama, will help teach you how to say it. So hence, it's very important that not only do we teach learners the rigors and vagaries of the human voice and how to express themselves. But now more than ever, I think it's important to also stress the need to develop your unique ability to have something to say, as opposed to you have to say something. I'm sure you can appreciate the irony in that. Um, social media perhaps is the best example of that where everyone feels the need to have to say something and tragically lands up forwarding someone else's material. Whereas perhaps would be better to stop, pause, think and have something to say of your own and then learn also how to say it. So hence speech and drama and communication skills should go hand in hand. And that's certainly what we've been doing with a lot of the schools in India and a lot of the teachers in India as well. Now, this is the uh, way in which we score. Um, I think you know this. If you're familiar with our existing systems, 85 and above is distinction, 75 to 84 is merit, 65 to 74 is pass, and below 64 uh, is below pass. Now, the other important part of the syllabus is the recognition because um, every grade has a unique qualification number, which is mentioned over here on page number six of the syllabus in your hand. Um, and if you don't have it, please just give us a shout. We'll 
may happily mail it across to you or Renu will do that. Uh, but essentially every grade has a unique qualification number and you can always visit this website here to verify that yes, this is the qualification that I've achieved. Now, what becomes even more interesting is if students are going abroad to study, particularly the UK, then grades six to eight carry something known as UCAS points. So if you are applying within the UK um, for admission into a college, you normally would go through the universities and college admission service um, uh, website. And in that you would mention that, yes, you've done so-and-so qualification, have achieved a distinction, and hence you're eligible to get these 12 UCAS points or 16 or whatever the so case may be. So this is a little bit about how it can be used in higher education in the UK. I'm sure you're going to think about other countries like Europe, uh, other European countries or Australia and the US, and we'll talk about that in the Q&A session. Now, because this is a skill and because skill implies two things, knowing and applying and requires time, on page seven of the syllabus, you will see this very unique thing known as the TQT table or the total qualification time table. How does one read this? Well, very simply what this means is that if you want to have a candidate at let's say an initial level of communication or the initial grade, it means that the candidate should have received approximately eight hours of guided learning through a teacher or someone who knows the subject or is able to teach communication, certainly at a level better than what the learner is. And thereafter, it means that the learner can go and independently apply it. So I'm gonna take you through some of the tasks and you will see, this is not like necessarily learning a poem or a prose extract. Some of the things that you will learn over here, like interacting and exchanging pleasantries can be taught, can be used in the classroom, but certainly can be used everywhere else. So hence the rationale of this entire skill-based approach is firstly to have guided learning or to have a teacher impart some element of knowledge to you and for you then to be able to apply. So at various grades, you can see the implied guided learning hours and the independent learning hours. Now, I wanna take a quick moment to talk about, um, you are a teacher and you're listening to all of this and you're saying, I've never done an exam. Does that mean I have to start all over again? Absolutely not. In fact, we more than ever understand that there are various things that we develop along the way through various exposures, through various opportunities, through various hardships um, that will sharpen your learning curve or may not have developed your learning curve as yet. But if you are someone who feels that, you know what, I think I can start directly at a grade six in communication skills, then immediately flip over, look at all the grades one to six, look at the kind of things that you should be able to do with those grades. And yes, I'll bet that you pretty much could perhaps start at a grade six, all right? But from when it comes to a young learner's point of view, I think it's quite important that you take them through the rigors of the different grades. Of course, that does not mean that every one of them has to do every grade. Like I mentioned, um, for instance, I'm based in Bombay and very often with my own students, in their first year, they normally would do a speech and drama initial exam. And in the following year, I would teach them a variety of things, including lesson plans from Jesse for speech and drama for communication skills but then I would have them do a communication skills exam. And the following year, I, I'd maybe a grade one. And the following year, I'd maybe do acting at a grade two. So you see, I take them through the different grades that I vary the subjects. And this way, the, the learning becomes a little more robust, a little more holistic. And yet it shows an element of dedication on the learner's part, which proves to be a track record that they can share with any, uh, uh, institution of higher uh, learning or any potential employer or anywhere that they want to apply or show their learning somewhere else. So what you also need to look at is that we don't just stop at grade eight. You can do an ATCL 
that's over here, that stands for an associate of Trinity College London. You can even do an LTCL. An ATCL, and I know Sri Lanka has plenty of ATCLs and LTCLs in speech and drama, which is, I tip my hat at you uh, for the good work. Um, but you can do exactly the same with communication skills. So in case you don't know, an ATCL is equivalent to a first year bachelor's degree and an LTCL is equivalent to a bachelor's degree. And um, in certain places, if you've got an ATCL and an LTCL, um, it's almost equivalent to an American conservatory uh, qualification. So that's a little bit about the syllabus and the core. Let's come to the most important page or the most important takeaway why this subject is relevant. And you can find this in the syllabus on page number four, where it specifically tells you what skills will you develop by working through the syllabus. And not only will it tell you the skill, it'll tell you the meaning of it and how the tasks and the support uh, while preparing for exams brings out these skills. So if teachers, you are talking to parents and parents want to know, ah, oh, communication skills, isn't it like English? Well, it's a lot more. So please have a look at this. I think it's really interesting information. Um, parents these days will also be a lot more sensitized to the possibilities and be far more aware of the potential benefits of developing these skills in their children. So these are the first list of four skills. There are also these. So you see the important ones are critical thinking, working under pressure, organizational skills, teamwork, all of that get developed through the syllabus. Which brings me now to the interesting part that perhaps you'd like to know more about, which is the exams and how does one prepare students? What do we do? What are the grades and so on? So. Um, by the way, if you are looking at the digital syllabus, just for your reference teachers, the 2010 version of our syllabus is expiring on the 31st of July. So you should only be looking at the 2020 syllabus, be it the in-person syllabus, although we are not offering in-person face-to-face exams at the moment, but there is no difference between the digital syllabus and the uh, 2020 and the face-to-face -face syllabus 2020. The only changes and modifications are with regard to how to deliver that task. All right, so let's get on with how does one go about preparing for these exams and teaching for it. So the first thing you need to know is this syllabus, all right, has four foundational skills and thereafter is broken up with learning outcomes assessment criteria and attainment descriptors. This is crucial for us as teachers, because remember, we are not teaching them a specific item or thing. Instead, we are looking at the learning outcome, all right, for that grade. So let me explain that to you further. So the foundational skills in this syllabus are these four, which means the rubric or the metric that we, we're gonna be using right through is communication, interaction, analysis, and performance. We are going, these become the four bedrock skills in this syllabus. Now, in addition to that, the learning outcomes are on page nine of the face-to-face -face syllabus or page 17 of the digital syllabus, all right? And they're listed sequentially one grade below the other. But the assessment criteria, which means how do we know that the learner has can has acquired the skill, all right, or the criteria on which we will assess them changes from grade to grade, as does the attainment descriptor that tells us they've done really well, or they needed to be a little better, or they didn't make the cut just yet. So that brings us to the exams and the grades. Now, coming back to teaching, all right, I am a teacher firstly and foremost, so hence, I'm gonna spend some time on this. Now, when you are going to teach the syllabus, you need to keep three things in front of you. You need to keep, firstly, the learning outcomes and the skills of the grade, okay? The second thing you need to consider is when you've taught them something, how should you measure 
all right, whether a learner can do it. And finally, of course, once they do it, how do you know whether they're doing it very well or there needs to be some more work? So these three things become pretty much your go-to pages in a syllabus. Now, when you try and map this all out, I'm just doing this for you as an example. If you were to try and lay it out all on a, one single slide or page, I'm doing this for grade initial, you'll see that the learning outcomes require a learner or a candidate to be able to participate in simple, informal conversational exchanges and communicate prepared information clearly and appropriately. So that's quite straightforward. Now, that means that you can, in your lesson plan, do anything that is going to help build informational conversational exchanges and prepare uh, share prepared information. For instance, who's in your home? Which school do you go to? What is there in your class? Uh, what are the parts of your body? Um, tell us a little bit about your favorite toy. So these are things that they all know and their ability to talk about it and to exchange information is what we're looking for. Now, at the same time, these are the skills that we're looking at. In task one, we're looking at communication and interaction. In task two, we're looking at communication, interaction, analysis, and performance. And in task three, we're looking at communication, interaction, and analysis. So task-wise also, there is a skill focus. And then of course comes the assessment criteria, which means that they should have been able to participate. This was the learning outcome in formal conversational exchanges. And here we are saying present using simple vocal skills meaningfully and clearly, which means that conversational exchange should have been clear, articulate and audible, All right? And so on and so forth. Now, similarly, when it comes to the attainment descriptors, I have created the three areas of measurement or the three metrics that we are using. Audibility and clarity most of the time will get you a distinction, whereas audibility and clarity most of the time, but use of vocal skills with some meaning as opposed to use of vocal skills meaningfully is the distinction or is the difference between a distinction and a merit. And similarly, a below pass would mean that was unable or hesitant uh, to either interact or little or no awareness of the audience or lacked audibility or clarity. So as you can see, it's not quite shades of gray. It's quite distinctive in being able to know what the attainment descriptors are. And of course, as some of you teachers would know, we are very known for giving every candidate an individual report which has something scrawled out over there which we normally take a week to decode of the examiner's yeah. handwriting but that's essentially the personal feedback that every examiner gives every candidate for every task okay now moving on uh, i'm going to now very quickly run through the grades so that we can spend some time talking this is grade initial all right one, two, and three, task one is common. Why is it common? Because at the earlier grades, all you want to do is just put you at ease and have a basic chat. So you're going to be talking, for instance, about the area where you live or your favorite meal, food or drink or your journey that day. It lasts for all of one minute, all right? Now, how would one prepare for this? Well, very simply, in terms of modeling classroom practice, it's P1 is participant one, P2 is participant two. P1 greets and asks a question. Participant two listens, uh, greets in return, answers, perhaps adds in a compliment and asks another question. And you could vary these talking points so that nothing appears learned. You can also use the help of Jesse materials or Jesse lesson plans from the earlier grades to help devise um, material and worksheets if you want, particularly in the online teaching environment. So this, for instance, is from a Jesse lesson plan, all right, where they're talking about, hello, I'm from here and you're from there. How are you? And nice to meet you. So 
things that help build small um, conversational skills. And quite frankly, the big skill of small talk, which tragically, as you would know, many adults don't have it. So I think it's very important that we teach it to kids as well. Now, when we look at grade, the task one for grade initial one, two and three are all the same. Why? We want to put you at ease. We want the child, we know they're feeling nervous. We want to let them relax. So the only thing we would vary a little bit is the talking points, okay? Now, what you want to watch out for is that it's natural, easy flowing, all right? There is a genuine ability to participate. It is authentic. There is vocal skills, eye contact. What you don't want to do, teachers, is over-practice this with your children. So unlike a poem, all right, here this needs to be natural. You cannot force uh, a normal conversation in an artificial way. Similarly, we do not need children to work with scripts and learn things by heart. You do not need a script to say, my name is so-and-so and I go to this school and today I came by car or today the weather is quite lovely outside, okay? We do not want to see anything which suggests learn by rote or committed to memory, not because it's not allowed, but because it's inappropriate. Nobody talks that way, okay? Now, moving on from there, looking at grade initial task two, where a candidate gives a talk about a small personal memorable event. So I've given you an example over here. What could be the memorable event? Maybe a Christmas holiday? So typically the parameters to consider as teachers would be these. What, when, where, why, who, how, which, which of course you all know the W's and the H's. So you need to provide the scaffold. The children need to just gap fill and fill in the blanks and very naturally it starts to become something uh, authentic and something which is meaningful. So you could also use visual aids, including photographs, posters, images, and so on. Now, if we look at grade one task two, here they talk about their remarkable person or a favorite holiday or their favorite activity. So as you can see, I've used the same Ws. And here, just as an example, I've kind of done one, all right, which was the Christmas break. But over here, for talking about the remarkable person, who is the person, describe the person, talk about the qualities and attributes. And if they're doing it for their favorite activity, perhaps these could be some of the leading questions to help formulate their uh, thinking and to help formulate their delivery. Which brings us to task two in grade two, wherein they share why I love this book or why I love this film or why I love a particular TV program or a dramatic play. They speak for four minutes. So of course we would call these things book reports in a normal English class, but this is exactly what children can talk about every day. In fact, they do it day in and day out talking to their friends about why they love Power Rangers or Doraemon or Chota Beam or um, Tom and Jerry or whatever it is. And very often you'll see, you can aid them with a story map, which helps them put their story into a sequence, starting with the setting or the characters or whichever one first, and then building it up into a rising action. And then of course to a climax. So they could then talk about it and finally give us their reasons five to seven reasons why they love that book or that film. All right, now it can't get any more authentic than that because the children have the complete flexibility to choose which film. Uh, it doesn't, it can be a regional film. It can be a Hindi film. It could be a Bollywood film. It could be a Hollywood film. Doesn't matter. Like I said, the focus is not on the content. The focus is on the skill and the ability. So, Moving forward over here, we now look at grade two, task three. And typically over here, the candidates talk about the planning and preparation for a special event. So keep in mind the planning and preparation, not about the event. 
So if you had to work with, let's say, a brainstorm with the children about a birthday party and they would fill in details like, let's say, the theme, the venue, the date, the time, the clothes, the decorations, the food, the beverage, the cake, the return presents, you kind of mind map all of that. And then you perhaps introduce a timeline and you ask the children to sequence it. Now, the special event, of course, birthday party perhaps is the most relevant for them, but it could be an annual day. It could be planning, uh, <coughs> excuse me, planning a trip, uh, a school trip. It could have been um, a sports day. It could have been a family celebration, a golden jubilee, a silver jubilee, or something of the sort. Anything that they define as a special event. All right. Um, so then, of course, you take it and they talk about what all they did in the run up to that special event or that special event day. All right, so I've given you this as an example to have a look. And then of course we come to this one, which is the start of the complex. And over here, they start to tell you why they're concerned about something, maybe global warming or the, or the virus or what they would like to see more of or less of or why they think something should be banned. This teachers is the start of persuasion, all right? And I think you'd know that they say 90% of adult communication is persuasion. So persuasion comes in from grade three. Here, as you can see, I'm using a brainstorm to capture their thoughts on a particular topic. And then I'm helping them build their argument or build their persuasive appeal based on Aristotle's rhetorical appeals, which talks about logos, pathos, and ethos, all right? Bringing, putting your stake, your feelings, and the logic of the argument in a context. Finally, of course, in grade three, task two, they talk about why I'm concerned about this and so on and so forth. They now bring it together in the form of a speech. So after you've helped them build their persuasive discussion, they now put together it all and deliver a speech, okay? Which brings me to the last task of grade three, wherein the candidate gives a talk about describing and recommending a place of interest. Now, rather than uh, me um, try and explain it to you, I'm gonna share with you actually coincidentally what a student of mine did um, a little while ago when she was talking about a holiday, interestingly enough, to Sri Lanka. So I'm just sharing my uh, screen with you. Now, this particular um, is right now in a PDF format, but it was done in slides. And then all she did is she printed it out, all right, literally on an A4 sheet, 300 GSM, that's the thickness of paper, so that it wouldn't fold while she was standing and talking. And she spoke about why uh, she was recommending Sri Lanka as a place to go to. So she started off like this. Uh, oops, sorry. Okay. And this was a second slide where you can see she talks about giving information and very gently starts to insert herself into these photographs. Of course, she was all of nine years old and loved to do that. Um, and then of course starts to share with us her information about the aquatic life, the marine life um, and so on. And then goes and talks about all the animals, the birds and stuff like that. And all the fauna and flora. And finally ends it with a little bit of information about Sri Lanka, all right? So she prepared this in about four, sorry, six sheets as you can see and held it up, stood, presented this to the examiner, validated all of her information with her own personal input as to what she felt along the way. So that brings me to the end of this webinar. And I'm now very happy to take a few questions. Of course, if you don't know this already, why Trinity and where the qualifications could lead, please go through this in the syllabus book, essentially, it's all about preparing our young learners for a future which is unpredictable and can only be dealt with through skills and the understanding of knowledge, but most importantly, 
with the application of skills. On that note, we're going to stop to look at the Q&A section and whatever questions you may have. I'm going to request Renu to come back in, please, as I stop sharing and now can chat with you rather comfortably. Thank you. Thanks, Dale. We have a couple of questions on the Q&A box, but please um, send in your questions. We have a, a few minutes to answer them. So the first one is about, from Wazna, is visual aids, are they compulsory, Dale? No, absolutely not. In fact, and that's a very good question, because very often we come across this thing of, I'm going to make a presentation and then um, need and seamlessly move into making a PowerPoint. All right. Please note, teachers, a PowerPoint is not a presentation. It is a visual aid. You are welcome to use visual and audio aids, but it's not necessary. And it certainly doesn't get you any extra brownie points. But I understand that, for instance, if you'd like to use it, uh, then please use it. In fact, one of the skills that we look at developing is the use of technology and digital skills through the syllabus. So candidates should be allowed to use it and they can use visual aids from literally grade initial, but the choice is really yours. Um, the next question I can see, should pupils be seated when they perform the speeches during the online exams? So here again, there is a guidance for every task. It's mentioned in your digital syllabus, literally alongside the grade. In a couple of cases, they will normally sit. Normally out of the three tasks, two of them they sit, one of them they must stand because one of them involves presentation and our syllabus is very, very close uh, to public speaking. All right. Um, and there's another one about PowerPoint presentations. Are candidates allowed to use PowerPoint as visual aids at these younger grades or what do you recommend, Dale? I would, so well, yes. I mean, there's nothing to say you can or you can't. I would always tell you this much, that please keep it appropriate. For instance, if a child is used to using PowerPoint in school and knows how to seamlessly transfer between slides and so on and so forth, then by all means, let them use it. But if they come into the exam room and for some reason the clicker doesn't work or the animation is not working or the iPad goes off and then they're bothered because of that, then it's doing a disservice to them. So I'm gonna leave that entirely up to you. For me personally, just to let you know, up to grade two, they use visual aids, but it's always printed out in the form of uh, something which is manageable in size, about an A4 size, which is in a horizontal or a landscape layout. For grades higher than that, uh, and certainly at the grades six, seven, and eight, by all means, please use whatever you need, from screens to projectors to laptops to whatever you want, you're welcome to do that. And that takes us uh, on to this uh, holding up visual aids to show the examiner. Uh, Ishani, I'm not sure if that's on a, in the online platform. I'm assuming, uh, Dale, you can do that and show it onto the camera so that the examiner sees it clearly. Is that uh, what yes, you can? But we keep updating the guidance on these. So when it comes closer to the exam, we probably will put out a few more clarifications. And that's the beauty about the digital syllabus is if there's one thing that we keep doing is releasing iterations or iterative uh, syllabi which basically clarify some of the finer points of delivery so closer to the exam taking time you can just check in with us and i'd be happy to tell you at that time what the guidance is but typically you can do both in certain cases you can share your screen in certain cases you can hold it up to them camera. And there's a question about um, digital exams. In Colombo right now, we are offering only digital exams. There are no face-to-face -face exams happening. Um, however, um, given the lockdown situation, the digital exam is also a center-based exam. So you do have to come into the center to do it. So unfortunately, with the lockdown, we can't have the center-based exams right now. But uh, we're hoping, we had put down, and I think in my email, I said June 30th was the next date for exams. So if we are out of lockdown and if the health and safety allows us, we will be going ahead with that session. If not, it might be pushed back to July. Okay, so can you please elaborate on the posture for a PPT presentation? Um, so I'm not quite sure in the context if you're doing this online and then already that's not a problem because you're sharing screen uh, with the examiner and 
thereafter, you can stand maybe about three feet apart from your camera and you would be able to talk your presentation through. Uh, if you're doing it physically, normally what would happen is we would have the examiner seated. We'd either put up a screen behind us and a projector. Uh, mind you, I do that only when I have a whole day of exams that are going to look like that. Otherwise that gets counted into your setup time. All right. But ideally what I would advise you is um, to do this on a laptop. All right. If you're doing a face-to-face -face exam is to do it on a laptop, keep it about three feet away from the examiner so that he can see it. You can also see it at an angle, position it like a triangle where you have the examiner at one corner, you have your table at one corner with the laptop and you are at this corner. So he can see it and you can see it and that way there's no problem. Uh, if you're doing it digitally, then it's even less of a problem because you'll be sharing the screen, which he can see, and he can see you also in the uh, picture and frame, and it'll be no problem at all. Okay, great. And should the candidate focus on addressing the audience as a virtual group? Um, I'm assuming that's for the digital exam. Yes, in, in almost all cases, our exams always talk about, and particularly from grades uh, three, four onwards, we talk about you need to state who your intended audience is. In the next webinar, I'm doing specifically grades four and five. And since I'm talking over there about grades four and five only, we probably can look at some more complex questions and scenarios, even in relation to today, what we've been discussing, uh, because I will have more time in considering we're covering just two grades then. Um, yes. Dilini has actually said later on, is that for initial to grade three, if it's just the examiner or the virtual group. So are the lower grades just the examiner focused, uh, Dale, or is it? Yes, I mean, essentially you're really talking to um, the examiner on a screen, all right. Um, my suggestion again would be, and this is the overriding assumption, is the examiner is always just one in the room when it comes to a talk or a presentation. And when it comes to the interactive task where you're asking and answering questions, then obviously it's a direct acknowledgement of the examiner. But otherwise, if you are standing, then please treat the examiner as one in the room and talk as if you were to an, to an imagined audience. Okay, and there's a question about UCAS points uh, for grade six to eight. Are they accepted in America and European universities? Um, no, I no. Sorry, go ahead there. No, so, well, um, the RQF is the regulated qualification framework which applies in the UK. You also have something known as the EQF, which is the European qualification framework. So you can check with the European University whether they accept EQF points. Uh, more importantly, when it comes to America, I have to tell you, sadly, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing um, in terms of college admissions, because each college tend to work, uh, tends to work on their own. Uh, but what I do definitely know is that we've had a lot of Indian students go abroad, or, and particularly to the US, and explain to the university that this is what they've achieved along the way. So they have usually a part of the application process which talks about additional achievements slash credits for work that they've engaged in. And that is something where they would typically enter this information in. Okay, very good. And uh, someone's asking for similar webinars in speech and drama, Dale. <laughs> I think that's, that's, that's a very good sign. I'm glad that you found this webinar useful and we will definitely look at bringing more webinars um, in the future. Actually on that note, if you don't mind, I'm gonna just request all of you, please teachers, if you could just give us your thoughts and your feedback. So I wanna just tell you, and I don't know why, um, but, y'all are unfortunately coming a little late to this party. And I say this because we've been doing this in India right through the entire lockdown. From July onwards, um, there you go. I just put a link in the, um, in the chat. So if you can just please click on that when this webinar is over or click on it now and open the thing, otherwise it'll vanish. But you will get a follow-up mail, which will give you a link to register for the next webinars as well as to also um, please take a couple of moments out, give us some feedback. Um, I'd like to be able to do a little bit more and help you wherever I can. Uh, just for your reference, we have done all these webinars uh, and not just in communication, we did it for acting, speech and drama and performance arts 
including professional development workshops in language, communication skills, and drama. So, Renu, I, please tell me why has nobody <laughs> known about well, it? Um, there are some webinars that we have sent information about. Okay. And as you said, they are recorded. Am I right, Dale? So That's we can right. access them through the, the India website. Yeah. Um, so we, yeah, you can. But I hope you'll register for the ones going forward. And, um, and we're hoping to continue with more webinars for speech and drama and English language as well. So um, what about the mark sheets? Have they changed according to uh, exam presentation live and online? Um, yes, very I much. Oh, so yeah. um, I think Renu would be able to tell you that the turnaround time is exceedingly fast um, yeah. in, the, in the case of online exams. And now, of course, you don't get a handwritten scrawl in terms of comments. You yeah. get something that is typed, but very much you do definitely get the individual comments based on each and every task. So that very much does continue to be there. Yes, the syllabus, yes, uh, you can get a copy of the syllabus. You can email us at info at trinitysrilanka.com. That's our email address. I'm gonna put it on the chat and we can either mail you a copy once lockdown's over or we can send you the PDF as well. You can also download it from the website. Um, so I'm gonna do one thing. Uh, teachers, just for your information, I'm going to send you, you will get a mail tomorrow at about the same time, three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, it's a system generated mail, but I will compile it. Uh, I'm going to give you the links to the feedback form, the links to register. And I'm also going to give you a Dropbox link from where you can download the syllabus, both the digital as well as the face-to-face -face one. Yes, that's correct. And um... Helena, you'd also asked about spoken English. There are some teachers who are, you know, new teachers to Trinity um, joining us today, Dale. So um, some of them may not be aware of all our, our syllabuses. So we do have spoken English and that's, um, Dale briefly touched on it at the beginning. That's uh, graded exams in spoken English or JESSE. Um, so we could send you those syllabuses too. So please email us your requirements and then we will send it to you if you don't already have the syllabus. So I'm just looking at a couple of the uh, comments in the chat. Can you use a flip chart or? A... Yes, typically you could in a face-to-face -face exam. Um, are UCAS points counted for universities around the world? No, UCAS points are specific to the UK, um, but every admitting college will have a system of recognizing uh, what you've done in prior work. So please just check with them individually and they'll be able to tell you that. Um, okay, I think we're good. Yeah, I think we're good. Yes. And there's one question about a printed certificate. Yes, you do get a printed certificate from Trinity. Yes, that's where the certificate comes from. And, and I think it's worth pointing out over here, Renu, that there is no difference in terms of the uh, qualification or the equivalence of the qualification, whether it is a digital exam or an in-person exam it's exactly worth the same, all right? So in case you're thinking like many other institutions or online education programs that the quality of an online certificate is less, absolutely not. In fact, that's why it took us a little while to get these things in order, all right? But the value of the qualification online or offline are exactly the same. Yeah, the Trinity Anthology, I think that's for drama, isn't it, Dale? That's right. Um, Someone's asking about getting a copy, and if I do believe it's on the website, the new one. Um, of? Is, uh, Trinity Anthology for 2020, is that on the website? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. So there is a brilliant anthology on the website, and which is completely searchable. Yeah. <laughs> and so I know if, you've, if you're one of the older teachers and if you are used to an older anthology, then you'll be in for a real surprise because we've really done pretty well. Um, and you will get tons of material that you'd really need, but of course it's all mainly speech and drama. Now, I just want to uh, preempt one other question or thought that may be going through your mind uh, in so much as why can't I put up some demonstration videos of exams? Because that's typically what you would like to have seen. So I just want to explain to you that the reason why we don't is because um, all these subjects are firstly very nuanced. One, two is there is no right or um, writer way of communicating, so to speak, which means that we basically want to see an, a candidate be authentic. And the minute we tend to put out a video, 
what would normally happen is everybody starts to think that that's the way to try and do it. And we don't want to do that because that just stifles creativity. Um, and instead we want to literally appreciate authenticity, uh, which is why we put the learning outcomes and we put the assessment criteria so you yourself can see what is it that you should be working towards and how exactly are we gonna be looking at it from the lens of an examining board. So hence we don't wanna handicap you by putting out someone else's work and you starting to feel that that's the only way to do it. That's why we don't put out videos. Uh, okay, there's a question about diploma grades changing. Uh, no, we haven't. Um, we've still got the um, diplomas. Um, unfortunately, we're not no, waiting. The Sorry, the diploma hasn't changed, has it, uh, Dale? No, it's no. the same syllabus, yes. Same diploma, but currently we're not offering the face-to-face -face diplomas. Uh, the only diploma that we do currently offer is the ATCL in communication skills, which is a recorded exam, actually, uh, mm -hmm. along with the ATCL in speech and drama and the others. We currently are not offering any of the teaching diplomas at the moment, uh, but I'm working to try and see if we can at least open that up soon enough to start at least some of the units being submitted. Yes, and also LTCL um, online is uh, digital is not available yet. No. So the LTCL is a three unit exam, which yeah. requires a written component of two pay of two hours, uh, yes. plus an, um, uh, an essay, plus a body of work. Yes. So in the case of certain teaching related qualifications, that body of work is actually case studies and so on. So hence, we're not doing the teaching diplomas just yet. Okay, great. So I think we have answered all the questions, Dale. Thank you so much for for this webinar. It was very useful. And from some of the comments, I can see everyone found it very helpful. And we look forward to next Saturday, same time for grade four and five, and then the following Saturday for the six to eight. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Renu. Thanks, teachers. Have a lovely weekend, but most importantly, stay safe and stay indoors. All right. Yes. Take care. Bye now. Bye, everyone. Thanks.